We humans are poised for a fall from an unimaginable height. Not because of one thing, not climate change alone, but all the human-caused changes the planet is suffering from. So why are bankers, industrialists, and environmental leaders only focused on the narrow solution of green technology? Is it the profit motive? And why, for most of my life, have I fallen for the illusion green energy would save us? Clearly, to answer this question, I needed professional help. Keep my stuff, but that ever. No, I n never heard. I'll, I'll just be honest with you about my dilemma. You can be my, um, you know, clinical social psycho. <laughs> it's like <laughs> the right has religion and they have a belief in infinite fossil fuels. Our side says, oh, it's going to be okay. We're going to have solar panels, we're going to have wind towers. As soon as I heard you talk about our denial of death, I'm like, could that be it? Could it be that we can't face our own mortality? Could we have a religion that we're unaware of? Absolutely. I think you've hit the proverbial nail on the head. What just differentiates people from all other forms of life is that, you know, we're not only here, but that we know that we're here. If you know that you're here, uh, then um, you recognize even dimly that you'll not be here someday. And on top of that, we don't like that we're animals. So we don't like that we're going to die someday. And we don't like that you can walk outside and get hit by a fucking meteor. What human beings did back in yesteryear is to envelop ourselves in culturally constructed belief systems. You know, call them cultures, call them worldviews, schemes of things. Uh, whatever you call them, every human community has them. Every culture uh, has an account of the origin of the universe. Every culture has a prescription for how you're supposed to behave while you're here. And every culture offers its denizens hope of immortality, either literally or, or symbolically. Then the question is, well, what happens when you bump into people who don't share those beliefs? Whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, uh, that's undermining the confidence with which you subscribe to your own views and exposing you to the very anxiety that those beliefs were constructed to eradicate in the first place. If we're to make progress, whatever that word means, or even to persist as a form of life, we're going to need to radically overhaul our basic conception of who and what we are and what it is that we value. Because the people that you referred to earlier, both on the left and the right, that think we're going to be able to discover more oil or solar panel ourselves into the future where life will look pretty much like it does now, you know, only cleaner and better. Either I, with more oil or greener correct. or both. I think that's just frankly delusional. What I'm hearing is that if I haven't come to grips with my own anxiety about death and life and presented with a reminder of that yeah i'm highly likely to make some tragic decisions for the community yes the only solution yeah. in principle uh, is uh, you know as uh, albert camus put it he said there's only one liberty to come to terms with death thereafter anything is possible i find that downright inspiring as for our environmental leaders who dwelt in comfortable illusions? How tragic of decisions were they capable of making? I was about to find out. claim they're just using forest residues, but actually a great deal of what the McNeil facility and lots of biomass facilities burn is whole trees. As you can see by this pile that's stacked right outside of the facility, these are trees. It turns out that the biggest source of green energy in Vermont is something called biomass, burning trees to create electricity. This is definitely not the way, and that the first step is actually looking at our lifestyles and how we can reduce our energy consumption. 
This is all the ash that has varying levels of toxic metals, great deal of radiation. As these trees have been absorbed. Oops, there's a... Oh. You're in the hot forbidden territory here. Are we? Let me ask both of you to come up to our house. Okay. Is that something you're interested in doing? It's not an interest. You got five seconds, or I'm calling 911. Okay. We got uh, two individuals here. The police will be down here in, in about two minutes. So you asked us to leave, and we're doing so. I'm so not asking you to leave. I'm asking you to come up to the office. Okay. Thanks for the offer. Maybe next time. You got everything here. So you have the number one polluter in the state that people think emits magical fairy dust from the smokestack. The reality is what you have is a facility that burns 400,000 green tons a year of trees. Now, this facility burns 30 cords of wood per hour. That's a hell of a lot of wood. And on top of that, it actually burns natural gas as well. And to think you would have to have 10 of these to replace one average coal-fired power plant. <laughs> it's, you know, it's just not going to work. It's just nuts. It takes a great deal of fossil fuels to cut down all of these trees to truck them in to use the big machinery to dump the wood chips everywhere so the idea that somehow this is not anything to do with fossil fuels just doesn't even make any sense it's, it couldn't happen without fossil fuels in fact how did the environmental groups get pulled into this obviously the main factor is delusion a lot of these environmental groups have been saying that all we have to do is for instance you know switch our fossil fuel economy over to a few solar panels and windmills and we can continue living life you know, as normal, some of the environmental groups have been for years touting facilities like this, saying that, you know, number one, it's carbon neutral, that this will actually help us fend off climate change because there are no CO2 emissions. It actually emits over 400,000 tons per year of carbon dioxide. Oh, but once we cut them, they'll grow back. They'll grow back over a period of decades to centuries. But if we cut every tree in the United States, it would be able to power the country for a year. You know, and then what happens when, you know, the, the streets are gone? I discovered biomass plants were not even always biomass plants. This is actually a solid waste incinerator that's posing as a biomass plant. The impact on this community is is severe. Um, the plant is right next to its Head Start school for preschool kids. There is Green Hill Manor, and that's an assisted living senior uh, residence. And there's also a Catholic elementary school right next door. How do you know they're polluting? Can you see it? We can see or? it. The snow at the elementary school and at the at the preschool is covered with black, some kind of black soot. We just had it analyzed and it came back as um, mostly tire chips. They have to add tire-derived fuel to raise the temperature of the fire because anybody who's trying to burn green wood or wet wood knows that it doesn't burn very well. But this biomass plant had yet another surprise. They admit that they burn 20.1 tons per hour of creosote-treated railroad ties. Besides that, they are allowed to burn 500 pounds per hour of PCP-treated railroad ties. These are shipped in from Canada. It's not green, it's not renewable, it's not carbon neutral, it's not anything that they claim to be. Yet, they got $11.5 million grant because it was classified as renewable. The plant owner told us that they were having trouble getting uh, enough wood chips. And he even asked us if we had any scrap wood where, where we lived, would we call the plant to let them know so they could come up and pick it up? We're not talking about some old industrial site. We're next to one of the most beautiful places we in the world. We are next to Lake Superior. This is Keweenaw Bay. This is actually Lance Bay. It's part of Keweenaw Bay. It's uh, Lake Superior, our lake. So it's a very sacred place to many people.